Thank you for joining us at FamilyChurch.tv. Today you're going to hear a message from our series, What If? So often we entertain fear by thinking about all the negative what ifs, but in this series we encourage you to awaken your heart to the positive what ifs. Now if this message or any other message ministers to you, we'd like you to email us at changedlife at familychurch.tv. We love to hear what God is doing in your life. If you'd like to partner with us financially, you can do that by clicking on our Give tab on our homepage, where you can also view all of our giving options. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to jump right in. I know that we have, we have limited time in, in this first service, and, and so we're going to jump right in this morning. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Acts chapter 10, and we're going to be there in a few minutes. I know, that, I know that Pastor Matt's been in a series for the last couple of weeks called What If? And so, as I was praying about the service and, you know, just saying, Lord, you know, what do you want me to share? What do you, what do you want me to teach this morning? And, and, and I really, you know, honestly, I, I just felt compelled to, to kind of uh, tag team with, with what Matt's already talking about and and so today we're going to talk about what if we were anointed like Jesus. How many of you think that that would be pretty cool? My heart longs for that. How about you? To be anointed like Jesus. And I know that we're on the right track because I was, I was in Pastor Matt's office early this morning and he has a dry erase board in there, and so, you know, I was kind of being nosy and reading his stuff, and, you know, <laughs> I'm just going to be honest. And uh, at the top, it said the anointing, and, and then there were some notes there, and it started talking about, you know, a release of the anointing and going to the next level and gaining advantage over the devil, and I'm like, man, that is, like, that's that's my sermon this morning. That's, those are my notes. Those are the things that I have uh, been thinking about for the last couple of weeks. And so I know, that we're, I know that we're on the right track. I know we're on the right track. Now, I want to start off with, with a poll, okay? Because I like, I like interaction whenever I'm teaching. And so I want to start off with a couple of questions before we, get into, before we get into the word. How many of you grew up in more of a charismatic, Pentecostal style church? Can I see your hand? Okay. How many of you grew up in more of a traditional Baptist style of church? How many of you grew up heathen? <laughs> I knew it! <laughs> Bo? I knew it. <laughs> we have a bunch of heathens here today. I think, that, I think that the anointing might be the most misunderstood aspect of our Christian experience, no matter how you grew up in church. And, you know, if you're like me and you grew up in more of a, of a charismatic, Pentecostal-style church, um, you've probably heard people say things like this, the preacher was anointed today, or, or that song brings an anointing, or I felt God's anointing. How many of you have heard things like that being said? Yeah, me too. And you know what? We all claim to want the anointing of God, but often don't know what the anointing is or, or how to get it, right? We don't know what it is or how to get it. Do you want the anointing? Yes, we want the anointing. What is the anointing? We don't know, but we want it. <laughs> Can you relate to that? You know, I've heard... So many teachings on the anointing of God, I'm not even sure until about a month ago that I knew what the anointing of God is. And so I really want to take a good look at this thing this morning, and we're going to talk about what if we were anointed like Jesus. So let's go ahead and let's start with Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. I think this is, you know, really uh, what it's all about. And, and it says this, it says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, for God was with him. And I just love that verse because that verse contains the who, the how, and the why of the anointing. Who was anointed? Jesus. 
How was he anointed? By the Holy Spirit. Why was he anointed? To do good, to bring healing, and to take power back from the devil. Okay, so here's what we're going to do with our time together this morning. We're going to talk about the anointing in three areas. What it's not, what it is, and then finally how to get it. Okay, how many of you think that sounds like a good plan? Okay, good, because that's the only notes I brought. Those of you that have been here on Wednesday night, you know me, you know my sense of humor. Um, so let me just go ahead and apologize right now to those of you that don't know me. But we're going to have a good time today, right? We're going to have a good time today. So let's start with what it's not. And I was thinking, you know, what is, if I could put it into words, how could I articulate this? What would I say if I were really to compress it into three different categories based upon everything that I've ever heard or been taught about the anointing in my uh, life journey. And so there's three things that I could think of. What it's not. Number one, the anointing is not volume. Loud preaching, loud shouting, loud music can be anointed, but being loud by itself is not the anointing. If that was the case then every time you argue with your spouse, revival should break out in your neighborhood. <laughs> right? It's like, do you hear Mike and Lindsay yelling at each other over, over, over there? Yes, they're such an anointed couple. <laughs> do you have some anointed moments at your house, Mike? If that's the case, a lot. A lot, right? How many of you know it's not, right? And I don't believe that. You guys are, you guys are good people. You may... You may yell a little bit, but you're good, right? So, so the anointing is not volume. Number two, the anointing is not talent. You know, talented musicians and singers can be anointed, but talent on its own is not the anointing. Let me give you an example of anointed talent from the scripture. It's found in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 23. And it says this, Whenever the Spirit from God came upon Saul, David would take his harp and play then relief would come to Saul and the evil spirit would leave him. And I just, I just love that verse. It wasn't David's musicianship that drove the evil spirit away. It was his anointing that drove the evil spirit away. And I was thinking about this as we were having praise and worship. You know, obviously, Amy is both anointed and talented, but her anointing doesn't come from her talent. It comes from her heart. So can we all agree that the anointing is not volume? And can we all agree that the anointing is not talent? Now here's the third thing. The anointing is not having a good church service. Let me explain that. Again, church services can be anointed. But a gathering by itself is not the anointing. Let me read a paraphrased story to you from the Bible. Okay, this is a story right out of the Bible. Paraphrased. They shouted out to God, shouting and dancing around the altar. As the service continued through lunchtime, they missed the deadline on the clock back there, right? As the service continued through lunchtime, the shouting got louder and they began to prophesy until supper time. Now, to me, that sounds like a charismatic church service. I mean, that sounds like something that was taken right out of the book of Acts, right? Dancing and shouting and prophesying. But did you know that that story is from 1 Kings chapter 18? And that's what was happening when the prophets of Baal were having their showdown with Elijah and they were trying to entice Baal to answer them. Now, I'm not saying that those things are bad. I'm just saying that by themselves, without God's power, shouting and dancing and, and whipping up a good church service won't help you. Right? Won't help you without, without God's power. So volume is not the anointing. Talent is not the anointing. A good church service is not the, the anointing. Those things can be anointed, but by themselves they have no power. So what is the anointing? Well, we read about it in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. And remember the verse, it said, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good 
and healing all who were under the power of the devil, for God was with him. And so in that verse, there are three functions of the anointing, and I want to give you those real quick. Number one, the first function of the anointing is for doing good. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good. Now, I think it's worth noting that this is the only time in the New Testament that that particular word for good is used, and it's tied to bringing relief to others. So if you were to read that verse in context, it would say this, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about bringing relief to others, right? That's what the anointing is about. It's about you and I bringing relief to others. Guys, the anointing is less about how high you can jump during worship and more about how low you're willing to stoop in order to bring relief to others. Remember the story where they brought the woman caught in adultery to Jesus? And the first thing that Jesus did when she comes in the room is he, he stoops down and he begins to write in the sand. Why did Jesus do that? Because the anointing stoops. The anointing stoops. And so the first function of the anointing is God will anoint you so that you can bring relief to other people. How many of you know some people that need some relief? And you may be those people yourself. Number two, the second function of the anointing is for healing. How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good and healing. Now, get this. The word healing there is not only tied to the laying on of hands and seeing the sick recover. At its heart, it means to restore and mend, okay? So when you are anointed, you usher in restoration and you mend those who are broken. An anointed person is God's seamstress. They go in there and they sew up those that are ripped and torn. So again, if we read it in context, it would say this. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about bringing relief to others by restoring and mending them. Okay, so now we're starting to see. We're starting to get glimpses of what the anointing is. The third thing is this. The third function of the anointing takes power from the devil. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil. This is awesome. The word power there is tied to oppression, exploitation, and domination. So the anointing gives you power over the devil specifically in those areas. Now, if we were to read that verse in context, it would say this, how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about bringing relief to others by restoring and mending them. He rescued them from the oppression, exploitation, and domination of the devil. Listen, that's the anointing. Okay, how many of you are with me? this morning. Now, just hang on because it's going to get better. That's the anointing. Restoration. Right? Mending and repairing those that are broken. Taking power back from the devil. Those things are, are what Jesus was anointed to do. So, now that we know what it is, now that we know what it is, wouldn't it be nice if we knew how to have it? Wouldn't that be great, you know, if we, if we knew what to do in order to be anointed? So what if we were to go back to the Old Testament to when God was giving Moses the instructions on how to make the original anointing oil that they used in the tabernacle? And what if we looked at the ingredients in the anointing oil and what if they painted a picture for us on how to invite the anointing into our, our own lives? How many of you think that would be a good idea? Well, I'm glad because I've already done that. So that's how we're going to spend our next 20 minutes. 
We're going to go back to the Old Testament. If you have your Bible, Exodus chapter 20, or 30, I'm sorry. Exodus chapter 30. We're going to go back to when God was giving Moses instructions on the tabernacle, he was very uh, matter-of-fact. And he would, would tell him specific colors, and he would tell him the specific dimensions, and he, he would give him all of this information. And then when it came time to make the anointing oil that everything in the tabernacle was supposed to be anointed with, everything in the tabernacle that was supposed to be anointed, God said, here is the recipe. Here's what I want you to do. And we find it in Exodus chapter 30 and verse 22, and it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Take the following fine spices, 500 shekels of liquid myrrh, half as much, that is 250 shekels of fragrant cinnamon, 250 shekels of fragrant cane, 500 shekels of cassia, all according to the sanctuary shekel, and a hen of olive oil. Make these into a sacred anointing oil, a fragrant blend, the work of a perfumer. So guys, that's why she takes so long to get ready. She's in the bathroom making this, this oil. <laughs> And then he goes on and he says, then use it to anoint the tent of meeting, the ark of the testimony, the table and its articles, the lampstand and its accessories, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offerings and all its utensils and the basin with its stand. You shall consecrate them so that they will be most holy and whatever touches them will be holy. Anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them so they may serve me as priest. Say to the Israelites, this is my sacred anointing oil for the generations to come. That's us. Do not pour it on men's bodies and do not make any oil with the same formula. It is sacred and you are to consider it sacred. Okay? Now, before we get into the ingredients, I want to point out something. God tells Moses, he says, Moses, this Oil is not to be used or imitated outside of the temple. And one translation I found said this, you must not reproduce it. In other words, you can't get it anywhere else but the temple. And can I just go ahead and say that the world has been trying to reproduce what only comes from God for a very long time. For a very long time, the world has always tried to manufacture its own oil. Why? Because people need relief, people need restoration, broken hearts need mended, we need power over life's problems, and so the world has always tried to offer people that, and the problem is they just go to the wrong place to get it. And so God was very specific, and God said, you can only get it at the temple. Listen, that's a message that I want my kids to hear. How about you? That's a message that I want my kids to hear. I have a 20-year-old son and a 14-year-old son, and I want them to know that what they need to live successful lives, they can't get it out there. It, only, it on, only comes from the temple, right? So God told Moses, he said, you, you can't reproduce it. You can't get it anywhere else. It only comes from, it only comes from the temple. And, and then he gave, him, he gave him a list of five ingredients. And man, I, I think these things are so awesome because they really do paint a picture for us of what the anointing is all about. And the first ingredient was myrrh. Everybody say myrrh. Myrrh was for the purpose of purification. And so whatever it touched, no matter how unclean it was, it purified. And I'm not surprised that the very first ingredient was for the purpose of getting rid of contaminants. I think that you and I would call those contaminants in our lives sin. And so, yes, God forgives sin, and, and, and yes, sin, uh, heaven will be full of sinners, and I'm, and I'm grateful for that. But anointed people understand that there are no side deals with God. That there are no, there are no loopholes in the Scripture. Guys, purity was the very first ingredient 
It was the very first thing. He said, you want the anointing? Okay, the very first thing that you need is, is purity. And you know what? I'm not, I'm not talking about making mistakes. We all do that. No one is perfect. I'm talking about an area of your life that, that you know contradicts the scripture, but you pretend that God is just okay with it. You pretend that, that God has just given you a wink and a nod. And so the very first thing that God told Moses to put into the oil was for the purpose of getting the crud out. So if you want to be anointed like Jesus and, and, and have all of those things that we mentioned earlier, then the crud has to go. Now get this, myrrh was used for soothing pain and healing wounds. I love that. When applied to a wound, it would stop the bleeding. When applied to a bruise, it would lift the pain out. And here's the lesson. Any area of open disobedience that you have in your life causes a lot of pain and it causes a lot of bruising, doesn't it? And not just to you, but to the people that are in your world. Right? I mean, it does. I mean, any area of open disobedience, that's, we, there's a lot of pain in that. There's a lot of bruising in that. But look what it says. When you add myrrh or when you add purity, that pain and that bruising just automatically get lifted out. So as the crud gets lifted out, the pain and the bruising get lifted out too. You see that? And so no wonder he says the very first thing, if you want to be anointed like Jesus, is you have to get purity in your life. Now, guys, I'm not one of these people that enjoys pointing out the sins of others. I have plenty of my own sins to point out if I want to start pointing at sin. I'm not going to be one of these people standing on the corner holding a sign, you know, that says, repent ye sinners. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You know, I, that's not my style. I don't do that. But, but I do want to say this. The sin that is most destructive in your life right now is the one that you are the most defensive about. Right? We got to get this. We got to get this. If you want to be anointed like Jesus, the very first ingredient is what? Purity. Purity. You come before God and you say, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm going to try to live as close to your word as I can. I know there, there are no side deals. I know that there are no loopholes. I know that what is written is still written. You follow? If I want to, if I want to, be anointed like Jesus, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. If I want that kind of anointing in my life, I have to do more than just come to church on Sunday morning. I have to deal with my sin. And so do you. You follow? Now, number two, the second ingredient was uh, cinnamon. And I, I love this because, you know, cinnamon has burning qualities. It, it's a pleasant sensation and it's a fiery sensation. My first, you know, I think my first memory of cinnamon would be like big red gum. Anybody, can, can, right? How many of you, do they still make that? Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, so, okay. And then there's this thing right now on, on line is the cinnamon challenge. Have you seen that? I was going to bring Kevin up here and have him do it. <laughs> but then I watched the video of what actually it is. So don't, don't do that. It's cinnamon. And here's the thing. It's, it's a pleasant sensation. And it's a, listen guys, it's a fiery sensation. It's like the upper room. There was fire, but it was pleasant fire, okay? There, was, there were cloven tongues as a fire, but it was, it was pleasant fire. I, I need to go ahead and say this. The Holy Spirit is not weird. People are weird, right? Okay, it was pleasant fire. It was, it was everybody say pleasant fire. <laughs> the anointing is pleasant fire, the Holy Spirit is not weird. People are weird. And I have seen people do the craziest things under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. How about you? I remember back in the 90s when, 
when in certain charismatic circles, people were like barking like dogs and crowing like roosters and roaring like lions under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Listen, that's dumb. <laughs> hey, don't be doing that. If you need to crow like a rooster, go out in the parking lot and do that, okay? And I think Pastor Matt would be like, amen. <laughs> you don't have to be a weirdo or go to a weird church to be anointed. I'm all for the fire of the Holy Spirit, but let's be a warm fire that shows God off and not us off. Right? That's the purpose of the anointing. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasant fire. You're not anointed because... You walk around casting demons out of doorknobs. You're anointed because you have the fire of God inside of you. Right? You're like, well, I do that all the time. <laughs> well, stop. You're weirding everybody out. <laughs> I remember 20 years ago, I was pastoring this church, and there was a lady there, and Every time she would pray for people, she would literally shake the living daylights out of them. I don't mean, Johnny, not like a gentle nudge. I mean like she was trying to rattle their brains out their ears. You know what I'm talking about? So I went to her and I said, you can't do that here. And she said, oh, you're, you're too young to understand, but when I do that, the, the anointing comes. And I said, well, you take your anointing somewhere else. Because if that's the anointing, I don't want it. Right? It is a pleasant fire. It's like cinnamon rolls. Right? Come on. It's not the cinnamon challenge where you eat a tablespoon of cinnamon. It's like cinnamon rolls and a hot cup of coffee. Let's, let's do that after church. <laughs> right? It's, 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 it's fire, but it's pleasant fire. Okay? So, so here, here's where we are, okay? You want to be anointed like Jesus? Okay. Get the sin out of your life. Quit pretending that God's okay. Quit pretending that you're different. Quit pretending that God didn't mean you, okay? Quit pretending. Yeah, but, you know, Larry, you don't understand. Listen, your situation does not change the scripture, okay? And, and if you're really defensive about it, it's, it's because that is the most dangerous area of your life. So you gotta do that. And then, and then number two was the cinnamon. It was the, it was the pleasant fire. And then finally, number, or number three, we're not to the finally yet, but number three was Cain. And the third ingredient is Cain. Cain had incredible sweetness. Everybody say sweetness. I, I love this ingredient. And each of these honestly could, could be their own teaching, but we don't we, we have our limited time this morning, so let's get into this. Cain was used to cure a sour stomach. To cure a sour stomach. It, it, was, it was very, very sweet. Guys, the anointing makes you sweet, not mean. Obviously, Jesus was anointed. And I think we overlooked the fact that, that part of that was because he was an awesome guy. Do you think children gathered around Jesus to hear him give a lecture on the second dispensation of grace? No, they gathered around Jesus because he was sweet and he was kind and he was gentle and, and he was approachable. You know, Jesus in the Old Testament was described as being the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley, two plants known for their incredible sweetness. I want to say it. If you want to be anointed, maybe you just need to be nicer. Maybe you don't need to go to another conference on spiritual gifts. Maybe you need to holler less at the people in your house. See, I'm going back to my church next week so I can say whatever I want. <laughs> right? It's like, I'm leaving after today, I, you know. <laughs> Jesus was sweet. The anointing makes you sweet. So here's where we are. The anointing comes when, when we're pure, before God, the anointing comes when we invite pleasant fire, and the anointing comes when we're sweet. And the fourth ingredient was cassia. 
And cassia is, is very nourishing. It contains everything the body needs for survival. Here's what I found out about cassia. When swallowed, it has the ability to break up toxins that have built up in your body and flush out all the poisons, while at the same time supplying all the nutrients the body needs. Another thing about cassia, cassia only grows at the highest mountain elevations. And so to get it, you had to leave behind where you were. You had to leave your home behind on the valley floor. And you had to be willing to go up higher. And as I was looking at this ingredient, I see forgiveness in this ingredient. I do. I see forgiveness. When we add cassia to our lives, it, it flushes out anger. It flushes out resentment. It flushes out bitterness. It helps us to deal with our past. Guys, it helps us to leave where we've been and go up higher. It gets the poisons out. It gets the toxins out. I wish I had an hour to talk to you about forgiveness because it's so crucial to the anointing. But again, Jesus is our example. So we see Jesus lying on the cross, nails being pounded through his hands, nails being pounded through his feet, and all of a sudden, the, the cassia, the anointing inside of him speaks up and says what? Father, kill them all. I hate them. <laughs> what is, that's what I would have said. What, what did he say? <laughs> Father, forgive them. For, why? For they know not what they do. So when we decide to forgive, we're saying, Lord, I want to be anointed like Jesus. Finally, the fifth ingredient is was, was olive oil. And, and this is a big one, and we don't have time to talk about it, but we're just going to hit the high points. First, let, let me just, here, here's where we are, okay? The anointing comes when you're pure before God. The anointing comes when you invite pleasant fire. You're like, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. You know, not so that I can show off and be weird, but so that I can show you off and present you to a world that's dying without you, right? Number three, the anointing comes when, when you're sweet, you know? You're, you're nice, you're pleasant, you're, you're gentle, you're, 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 you're kind, you're, you're, you're approachable like Jesus was. And then, and then fourth, when you have decided to forgive and let some of those things go from your past and go up higher. And then the fifth ingredient is olive oil. And this one's awesome because olive oil does two things. First, it illuminates. You put it in a lamp and it lights up. Second, it lubricates. So it loosens and helps move stiff joints and it frees up barely moving parts, okay? Now, the olive oil was the base for the anointing oil and so all the other ingredients were added to it. So what does that mean? The olive oil was the facilitator, okay? And you added all the rest to it, okay? So it was the base ingredient that you need. It held the rest together. Now, I see the church here in the olive oil. Why? Because we illuminate. We are the light of the world. And Mike and I were just talking about that before church, that we are the light of the world, the city set on a hill, right? So, so we are the light. Number two, we not only illuminate, we lubricate. We are not a bunch of religious stiffs around here, right? We're free to worship, right? We're free to lift up holy hands and, 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 and go after God. And so I see the church here. Now here's the lesson. The anointing oil needed a facilitator. And the anointing needs a facility. It needs something to operate out of. Now the facility is not this building and it's not the real life building. The facility is you. You are the base and all of the other ingredients that we talked about earlier are added to you. Why? Because you are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, right? And so here's what we know. Purity. The pleasant fire of the Holy Spirit. Sweetness. Forgiveness. All facilitated by you. When you sing that song, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. How, you guys sing that song here? Remember back in the day when we would sing anointing fall on me, anointing? That's a dumb song. Don't sing that song. The anointing doesn't fall on us. It comes up out of us. Now that I've insulted half of you. 
Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. You know what you're saying when you say, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here? You're saying, Lord, get all, the, get all the sin and crud out of my life. Lord, I invite the pleasant fire of the Holy Spirit. Lord, help me to be sweet and kind and gentle and approachable. And Lord, help me to release forgiveness to anyone that has uh, inflicted pain upon me in, in my past. Guys, are you starting to see how it comes together? All right, let's all stand. We, uh, my notes say, be done by 10.06. <laughs> and it's 10.04. So, we have to pray now. We get to pray now. But you know what? I think you get the general idea, okay? Now, given that recipe, given the definition of the anointing that we talked about this, this morning, how many of you can genuinely say now, I know what the anointing is and I want it? Okay, me too. And so I'm gonna pray for you today before we go. And, and before I pray, let me just say this. If you're here um, in the service and you are um, not in relationship with Jesus Christ, then obviously that is the most important thing. You know, if you haven't repented for your sins or maybe you have at one time, but you know, life happened, things happened and, and you've drifted away from God. Listen, you are the most important person here in this room today and, and we wanna pray for you and pray with you and, and help you to invite Christ into your life and, 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 and we wanna do that before you go. But so um, if you're here and you don't know the Lord, I, you know, I'm just gonna give you an opportunity to, to come up in a second. We'll pray for you. Um, and if not, we're gonna just throw a big blanket of prayer out over all of you today and, and, uh, and talk to the Lord about this anointing that we so desperately want. So let's pray. Lord, we come this morning and you know, we don't understand everything fully, but we do know that the word has left us very clear instructions. And so Lord, first of all, I pray for those that might be here today that don't know you. Maybe they've never known you. Maybe they came to church on a whim this morning. Maybe someone invited them. And as they look into their heart, they realize that Jesus is not Lord. Jesus is not Lord. Jesus is not on the throne of their heart. And so I pray today, God, that you would send the Holy Spirit to convict that heart. And Lord, that they would come forward even now. Lord, even now that they would step out from where they are standing and they would be brave and bold and they would walk to the front of this room. And Lord, that we could pray with them and we could help them to experience this Jesus that we, that we have been talking about today. Lord, so that they too can be anointed like him. So Lord, I pray for that first. Lord, Secondly, I pray for every uh, man, every woman, every boy, every girl, every teenager in this room today. And Lord, you know what? I don't understand everything about the anointing. I don't. I don't. But I do know this. I know that Jesus was anointed and I do know that he went about doing good, mending people. I know that he... Um, went about healing, uh, just sewing up the brokenness in, in those that were there around him. I do know that. Lord, I know that, that he had power over the devil. And I, I, I Lord, we, we, we want that. We want that for our lives. We want that for our families. We want that for uh, our churches. We want that, Lord. We want that. We want to be anointed like Jesus. What if, what if we were anointed like Jesus? And so, Lord, I pray that we could deal with the sin issue. Lord, even now, there, there are people here talking to you about that sin issue. They know that when they leave here, they're going to have to make some adjustments in their lifestyle. They know they're going to have to cut some people loose. They know they're going to have to do some uncomfortable things. They know that they're going to have to make some changes. And, Lord, they're going to need you to help them with that. And so I pray for that right now. Lord, others that, Lord, maybe they're here today and, and um, they, they, need, they just need to be kinder and gent have a gentler spirit. They need to be more approachable. They need to be more inviting to the people that are in the world. Lord, maybe those that, that need to release forgiveness. Lord, I don't know, but I know that you know. And I just pray today for every, for every individual heart, for every individual family, for every, uh, Lord, for every individual situation. Lord, help us to be anointed like Jesus. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Lord, that's what we want. That's what I want. And we just claim that and accept that. Lord, that, 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 uh, that, uh, that cover over our lives. And we thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. And we all said, amen.